Hey crew, it's Pit and I am back with some more Esoterica. We are diving back into the works of the of Manly Hall, the secret teachings of all ages. We are reading aloud and discussing as we go along the various topics that are brought to light by the text. It's not the format for everybody, but some people seem to get some enjoyment out of it, so you are more than welcome to tag along. But before we begin, if you are unfamiliar with me, any of my unconventional beliefs, or if at any point in time you get lost in the sauce and have no clue what I am talking about, there are various playlists linked in the corner up here in the box down below along with the original source material so that you can get a better understanding of who I am and what I stand for. It is fairly clear in the beginning of the playlist, those things. We will be talking today about the cryptogram as a factor in symbolic philosophy. If you watched the last video, you know that I am not a fan of cryptograms. I am not a fan of puzzles being hidden. There can be keys that let you know, hey, there is something more to be read into this book. But if you have to go through an extensive process to try to extract that, it's probably being done at least in the wrong manner and probably with willful malignancy. So let's dive in and see how many toes I can step on today with the cryptogram as a factor in symbolic philosophy. No treatise which deals with symbolism would be complete without a section devoted to the consideration of cryptograms. The use of ciphers has long been recognized as indispensable in military and diplomatic circles, that is true, but the modern world has overlooked the important role played by cryptography in literature and philosophy. If the art of deciphering cryptograms could be made popular, it would result in the discovery of much hitherto unsuspected wisdom possessed by both ancient and medieval philosophers. It would prove that many apparently verbose and rambling authors were wordy for the sake of concealing words. Ciphers are hidden in the most subtle manner. They may be concealed in the watermark of the paper upon which a book is printed. They may be bound into the covers of ancient books. They may be hidden under imperfect pagination. They may be extracted from the first letters of words or the first words of sentences. They may be artfully concealed in mathematical equations or in apparently unintelligible characters. They may be extracted from the jargon of clowns or revealed by heat as, have, as having been written in sympathetic ink. They may be word ciphers, letter ciphers, or apparently ambiguous statements whose meanings could be understood only by repeated careful readings. They may be discovered in the elaborately illuminated initial letters of the early books, or they may be revealed by a process of counting words or letters. If those interested in Freemasonic research would give serious consideration to this subject, they might find in books and manuscripts of the 16th and 17th centuries the information necessary to bridge the gap in Masonic history that now exists between the mysteries of the ancient world and the craft masonry of the last three centuries. And I'm going to go ahead and pause here, right? I, I've said it before and I will say it again. I don't like the mo more complicated of the cryptographs. Not because I don't believe they exist. I even understand the necessity of them in certain instances. But I'm a big one on standing on what you are about, right? I'm a big one on go ahead and kill me if that's what it's going to take. If you want my, my knowledge to not be out there, you're going to have to take me out. That was a very real possibility back in the ancient days. And by ancient, I mean anything older than like 50 or so years. And so it is entirely possible that these things are there. But I do believe that it's better, for, better served by allegory than by cryptography. Yes, okay, you can pull out whatever from whatever. Like they have people going through the Bible every single day looking for things that are almost certainly not contained in there. There, you can find it though. There is enough letters and enough random orders that you can come up with whatever cipher you want to pull random information that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with anything. I am not convinced in any way, shape, or form that September 11th was presaged in the book of Revelations. And that if you had only had the proper key that you could have unlocked that knowledge prior to. It is really easy to look at prophecy and cryptograms through the lens of history and to read into them things that may or may not have been there. 
especially when you get to the point where you are omitting letters from words or you are shuffling them up, right? We saw an example last time that if you took this letter, this letter, this letter, this letter, and this letter that are in separate places and you put them together and you shuffle them, then you can get bacon out of it. Okay, yeah, you can do that. I'm sure that I could do that in this particular paragraph. The one on the screen right now, this one right here in the middle. I am sure somehow, some way, I can find a pattern that will show the word bacon in here. If it is unnecessarily complicated, it is almost certainly giving you information that is going to lead you down a path that is not fruitful. I believe in fruits. The things that I tell you, you can put into practice and literally change things in your life with them. If not, then I have not done my job in relaying the way to do those things correctly. I warn you about the risk. I talk to you about the steps that you need to take in order to make it happen. And if you follow those things, then you should be able to reproduce what I do. It is not something that is overly complicated. It is not something hidden and shrouded necessarily, right? These are things that I have pulled out from the hidden and shrouded. Again, I do not dismiss that there are codes, right? I am sure that there was a mason who wrote a book and put a code in it so another mason would be able to decode that particular thing. But I don't necessarily hold that masonry has all of these secrets that they purport to. There are several things that we have seen in here that they have absolutely misinterpreted. So, <clears throat> the arcana of ancient mysteries was never were never revealed to the profane except through the media of symbols. Symbolism fulfilled the dual office of concealing the sacred truths from the uninitiated and revealing them to those qualified to understand the symbols. Forms are the symbols of the formless divine principles. Symbolism is the language of nature. With reverence, the wise pierce the veil and with clearer vision contemplate the reality. But the ignorant, unable to distinguish between the false and the true, behold a universe of symbols. It may well be said of nature, the great mother, that she is ever tracing strange characters upon the surface of things. But only her eldest and wisest sons, as a reward for their faith and devotion, does she reveal the cryptic alphabet, which is the key to the import of these tracings. Now, symbology in actuality. That I don't have a problem with, right? Concealing things in artwork that is readily available with the proper key, right? If you know that this person had this thing in mind whenever they created this thing by the use of a symbol and it unlocks those things, that is, that is true. That is easy, right? Here's the key. Oh, these things mean this because of this key. But you don't have to go and say, well, this wing on this cherubim gets put onto this particular dog and it makes it into a unicorn, right? That's the same thing that I look at these complicated patterns with. I'm a pattern guy. I really like patterns. I like hidden things. I love conspiracies. It is my bread and butter, so to speak. And so I have to have a skeptical eye or else I would be pulled in by all of them. In my experience... The more complicated it gets, the harder it is to prove true. But there is absolutely things hidden, right? There are absolutely hidden knowledges. There are things that was concealed from other people. I just get into skepticism the further we get into the complications, right? It is looking at a picture is fairly easy, right? And if you don't have the key that you know that the caduceus is the symbol of medicine, then you can look at that and be like, wow, that's a weird picture, but okay. But if you have the key that the caduceus is a symbol of medicine, then every time you see the caduceus, you know that it's just talking about medicine, right? In actuality, is not really talking about medicine. The actual key for that is the, the balance, right? You have the two snakes climbing up and down the, sta the, the stick, that is the duality, that is the balance, that is knowledge and application. <clears throat> the temples of the ancient mysteries evolved <clears throat> evolve their own sacred languages, known only to their initiates and never spoken save in the sanctuary. The illumined priests considered it sacrilege to discuss the sacred truths of the higher worlds 
or the divine verities of the eternal nature in the same tongue as that used by the vulgar for wrangling and dissension. A sacred science must needs be couched in a sacred language. Secret alphabets also were invented, and whenever the secrets of the wise were committed to writing, characters meaningless to the uninformed were employed. Such forms of writing were called sacred or hermetic alphabets. Some, such as the famous angelic writing, are still retained in the higher degrees of masonry. I don't know the famous angelic writing. Secret alphabets were not entirely satisfactory. However, for although they rendered unintelligible the true nature of the writings, their very presence disclosed the fact of concealed information, which the priest also sought to conceal. Through practice or persecution, the keys to these alphabets were eventually acquired and the contents of the documents revealed to the unworthy. This necessitated employment of subtler methods for concealing the divine truths. The result was the appearance of cryptic systems of writing designed to conceal the presence of both the message and the cryptogram. Having thus devised the method of transmitting their secrets to posterity, the Illuminati encouraged the circulation of certain documents, specially prepared through incorporating into them ciphers containing the deepest secrets of mysticism and philosophy. Thus, medieval philosophers disseminated their theories throughout Europe without evoking suspicion, since volumes containing these cryptograms could be subjected to the closest scrutiny without revealing the presence of the hidden message. During the Middle Ages, scores of writers, members of secret political or religious organizations, published books containing ciphers. Secret writing became a fad. Every European court had its own diplomatic cipher, and the intelligentsia vied with one another in devising curious and complicated cryptograms. The literature of the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries is permeated with ciphers, and that's probably the explanation for that more than actual hidden knowledge, few of which have ever been decoded. Many of the magnificent scientific and philosophic intellects of this period dared not publish their findings because of the religious intolerance of their day. In order to preserve the fruitage of their intellectual labors for mankind, these pioneers of progress concealed their discoveries in ciphers, trusting that future generations, more kindly than their own, would discover and appreciate their learning. Many churchmen, it is interesting to note, used cryptograms, fearing excommunication or a worse fate should their scientific researches be suspected. Only recently, an intricate cipher of Roger Bacon's has been unraveled, revealing the fact that this early scientist was well-versed in cellular theory. Lecturing before the American Philosophical Society, Dr. William Romain Newbold, who translated the cipher manuscript of the friar, declared, There are drawings which so accurately portray the actual appearance of certain objects that it is difficult to resist the inference that Bacon had seen them with the microscope. These are spermatozoa, the body cells and the seminiferous tubes, the ova and their nuclei distinctly indicated. There are nine large drawings, of which one at least bears considerable resemblance to a certain stage of development of a fertilized cell. See Review of Reviews, July 1921. <clears throat> Had Roger Bacon failed to conceal this discovery under a complicated cipher, he would have been persecuted as a heretic and would probably have met the fate of er other early liberal thinkers. In spite of the rapid progress made by science in the last 250 years, it still remains ignorant concerning many of the original discoveries made by medieval investigators. The only record of these important findings is that contained in the cryptograms of the volumes which they published. While many authors have written on the subject of cryptography, the books most valuable to students of philosophy and religion are Philographia and Steganographia by Trithemius, Trithemius, Abbot of Spanheim, Mercury or The Secret and Swift Messenger by John Wilkins, Bishop of Chester, Oedipus, Egypticus, and other works by Athenius Kircher, Society of Jesus, 
and Cryptomyonitis et Cryptographiae by Gustavus Salinas. All right, we're going to drop back and check out a famous cryptic title page from Salinas' Cryptomyonitis de Cryptographiae. And again, I really wish that these were a little bit clearer. We have, obviously, a master dictating to someone else writings. Now, this could be a, an actual uh, master journeyman situation, master apprentice situation, and he is overseeing that. Or it could just be dictating the story because you can't write Shakespeare. <laughs> and we have some others that would, if they were clearer, we might be able to guess at these things. Let's just see what they have to say. One year after the publication of the first great Shakespearean folio, a remarkable volume on cryptogram and ciphers was published. The title page of the work is reproduced above. The year of its publication, 1624, was during the Rosicrucian controversy. The translation of the title page is as follows. The Cryptomaniasis and Cryptography of Gustavus, Gustavus Salinius in nine books, to which is added a clear explanation of the system of steganography of John Trithemius, abbot of Spinehaim, and Herbiophilus, a man of admirable genius, interspersed with worthy inventions of the author and others, 1624. The author of this volume is believed to be Augustus, Duke of Brunswick, the symbols and emblems ornamenting the title page, however, are conclusive evidence that the fine hand of the Rosicrucians was behind his publication. At the bottom of the picture is a nobleman, Bacon, placing his hat on another man's head. In the oval at the top of the plate, it is possible that the lights are beacons, or a play upon the name, Bacon. In the two side panels are striking and subtle Shakespearean allusions. On the left is a nobleman, possibly Bacon, handing a paper to another man of mean appearance who carries in his hand a spear. At the right, the man who previously carried the spear is shown in the costume of an actor, wearing spurs and blowing a horn. The allusion to the actor blowing his horn and the figure carrying the spear suggests much, especially as the spear is the last syllable of the name Shakespeare. So let's look at it again. Okay, so I see the spear. There's somebody talking to him. I don't know about handing him anything. And here's a man on a horse. Is that the guy with the spear? Is that a hat? Is that what it is? Or is it knowledge? Is that what it is? Okay. There's, there, again, if it was clearer, we could speculate some more. But to illustrate the basic differences in their construction and use, the various forms of ciphers are here grouped under seven general headings. <clears throat> the literal cipher. The most famous of all literal cryptograms is the famous biliteral cipher described by Sir Francis Bacon in his De Augmentis Scientarium. Lord Bacon originated the system while still a young man residing in Paris. The biliteral cipher requires the use of two types, two styles of type, one an ordinary face and the other specially cut. The differences between the two fonts are in many cases so minute that it requires a powerful magnifying glass to detect them. Originally, the cipher messages were concealed only in the italicized words, sentences, or paragraphs. Because the italic letters, being more ornate than the Roman letters, offered greater opportunity for concealing these slight but necessary variations. Sometimes the letters vary a trifle in size, at other times in thickness, or in their ornamental flourishes. Later, Lord Bacon is believed to have had two Roman alphabets, specially prepared in which the differences were so trivial that it is almost impossible for experts to distinguish them. I do have to point out, right, they did not have a ballpoint pen. Consistency of ink was a matter of being able to do that. I don't know if you have tried using your fountain pen, but I have. I used to take, I did calligraphy in middle school, right? I was fascinated by it. I, 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 I was not very good at it. I'm not artistically blessed in that particular manner. <clears throat> I'm good with ideas, not so much with putting them down. And so I, I understand differences and variations between the breadth of a word 
can absolutely have to do with the nub that you are using to write said word. That is something to bear in mind. Right? If you were talking about differences so trivial that you have to use a microscope to see the difference in the font of a fountain pen, maybe you're reading a little bit too much into it. I mean, it's possible. Again, I don't discount that there is part of the key, this subtle difference of a micrometer between the two. But for real, like, it's not like today where a pen, I don't have a pen with me. There's one over there. But is our pens are fairly consistent. Our pencils are fairly consistent. The amount of sharpening you use on a pencil, however, can make an immense amount of difference. It is the same with the nub. Right. The nub was literally a piece of feather that they shaped into the correct manner with a knife. That is something to bear in mind. The difference in how you sharpen that nub can make the difference being intimated here. Does not necessarily say that there has to be. Right Now, if it comes straight out and says, yes, if this letter is a sixteenth of an inch, taller than the one that next to it then that means something if that is stated clearly then okay but otherwise that is making an assumption upon your part I don't have that key I can't make that assumption a careful inspection wait I did that one right no <laughs> A careful inspection of the first four Shakespeare folios discloses the use throughout the volumes of several styles of type, differing in minute but distinguishable details. It is possible that all the Shakespeare folios contain ciphers running through the text. These ciphers may have been added to the original plays, which are much longer in the folios than in the original quartos. Full scenes have been added in some instances. The bilateral cipher was not confined to the writings of Bacon and Shakespeare, however, but appears in many books published during Lord Bacon's lifetime and for nearly a century after his B-death. In referring to the bilateral cipher, Lord Bacon terms it omnia per omnia. The cipher may run through an entire book and be placed therein at the time of printing without the knowledge of the original author. <clears throat> For it does not necessitate the changing of either words or punctuation. It is possible that this cipher was inserted for political purposes into many documents and volumes published during the 17th century. It is well known that ciphers were used for the same reason as early as the Council of Nicaea. Well, that lets you know something, doesn't it? The Baconian bilateral cipher is difficult to use today, owing to the present exact standardization of type and the fact that so few books are now hand-set. Accompanying this chapter are facsimiles of Lord Bacon's bilateral alphabet as it appeared in the 1640 English translation of the Augmentius Scientarium. There are four alphabets, two for the capital and two for the small letters. Consider carefully the differences between these four and note that each alphabet has the power of either the letter A or the letter B, and that when reading a word, its letters are divisible into one of two groups, those which correspond to the letter A and those which correspond to the letter B. In order to employ the bilateral cipher, a document must contain five times as many letters as there are in the cipher message to be concealed for it requires five letters to conceal one. The bilateral cipher is somewhat resembles a telegraph code in which letters are changed into dots and dashes according to the bilateral system. However, the dots and dashes are represented, respectively, by A's and B's. The word bilateral is derived from the fact that all letters of the alphabet may be reduced to either A or B. An example of bilateral writing is shown in one of the accompanying diagrams. In order to demonstrate the working of this cipher, the message concealed within the words wisdom and understanding are more to be desired than riches will now be deciphered. The first step is to discover the letters of each alphabet and replace them by their equivalent A or B in accordance with the key given by Lord Bacon in his bilateral alphabet, QV. 
in the word wisdom, the W is from the B alphabet. Therefore, it is replaced by a B. The I is from the A alphabet. Therefore, an A is put in its place. The S is also from the A alphabet, but the D belongs to the B alphabet. The O and M both belong to the A alphabet, is relate, replaced by A. By this process, the word wisdom becomes ba ba, sheep, treating the remaining words of the sentence in a similar manner, and becomes aba, understanding, aba ba da da, are aba, by look, and and are the exact same word, more aba ba, two ab. B, ab, desired, ab, 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 then, ab, ab, riches, ah. <laughs> the next step is run all these letters together. Thus, ba, 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 consist of groups containing five letters each. Therefore, the solid line of letters must be broken into groups of five in the following manner. Sorry, I'm having a lot of yawn today. Baba, aba, aba, ada, baba, ba, aba, ba. All right, each of these groups of five letters now represents one letter in the cipher, and the actual letter can be determined by comparing the two groups with the alphabetical table. The key to the bilateral cipher from the Augmentus Scientarium, QV, BAABA equals T, AABAA equals E, this equals E, this equals B, this equals L. Hold on. AABAA equals E, and then AABAA equals E. Alright, well, I'm not going to read the rest of those particular things, right? This equals B, that's L, that's P, that's X, that's E, that's E, and A. But the last five letters of the word riches, being set off by a period from the initial R, the last five A's do not count in the cipher. The letters thus extracted are now brought together in order, resulting in T blubixi. At this point, the inquirer might reasonably expect the letters to make intelligible words, but he will very likely be disappointed. For, as in the case above, the letters thus extracted are themselves a cryptogram, doubly involved to discourage those who might have a casual acquaintance with the bilateral system. The next step is to apply the nine letters to what is commonly called a wheel or disk cipher which consists of two alphabets, one revolving around the other in such a manner that numerous transpositions of letters are possible. In the accompanying cut, the A of the inner alphabet is opposite of H of the outer alphabet, so that, the, that for cipher purposes, these letters are interchangeable. <clears throat> the F and M, the P and Y, the W and D, in fact, all the letters may be transposed as shown by the two circles. The nine letters extracted by the bilateral cipher may thus be exchanged for nine others by the wheel cipher. The nine letters are considered as being on the inner circle of the wheel and are exchanged for the nine letters on the outer circle of the wheel, which are opposite the inner letters. By this process, the T becomes A, the two E's become L's, the B becomes I, L becomes S, the P becomes W, the X becomes E, and the two E's become L's. The result is all is well, which broken up into words reads all is well. All right, so let's check out this. The key to the bilateral, wait, we got one more. The an example of bilateral writing. All right, so. Wisdom and understanding are more to be desired than riches. In the above sentence, note carefully the formation of the letters. Compare each letter with the two types of letters in the bilateral alphabet reproduced from Lord Bacon's uh, The Augmentus Scientarium. A comparison of the D in wisdom with the D in and discloses a large loop at the top of the first, while the second shows practically no loop at all. 
So let's look at that. That is the D here. There's a D here. There's a D here. And D here. So this D is definitely different than these other D's. Right? Contrast the I in wisdom with the I in understanding. So that is here. The I here and the I here. One is dotted and one is not. In the former, the lines are curved and in the latter, angular. A similar analysis of the two R's and the desired reveals obvious differences. The O in more differs only from the O in wisdom in that it, that, in that it, a tiny line continues from the top over towards the R. The A in than is thinner and more angular than the A in R, while the R in riches differs from that in desired and that the final upright stroke terminates in a ball instead of a sharp point. These minor differences disclose the presence of the two alphabets employed in writing the sentence. The key to the bilateral cipher from Bacon's De Augmentis Scientarium. And here we have that. After the document to be deciphered has been reduced to its A and B equivalents, it is then broken up into five letter groups and the message read, read with the aid of the above table, which is that one, and then this one. Right? This is fairly, like we learned this in second grade, like how to substitute letters into a code. I don't doubt that it is possible, right? Uh, the above diagram shows a wheel cipher. The smaller or inner alphabet moves around so that any one of its letters may be brought opposite to any one of the letters on the larger or outer alphabet. In some cases, the inner alphabet is written backwards, but in the present example, both alphabets read the same way. The bilateral alphabet from Bacon's De Augmentis Solitarium. Here is the outlaying of the different uh, font styles, right? This is how you can tell the difference between A and B, A and B. And there is a difference, like, right? You can definitely tell the difference. This was definitely a code that he definitely created. The purpose of it is up for debate, but it is there. This plate is reproduced from Bacon's De Augmentis Scientarium and shows two alphabets as designed by him for the purpose of his cipher. Each capital and small letter has two distinct forms which are designated A and B. Ooh. The bilateral system did not in every instance make use of two alphabets in which the differences were as perceptible as in the example given here, but the two alphabets were always used. Sometimes variations are so minute that it requires a powerful magnifying glass to distinguish between the A and B types of letters. Of course, by moving the inner disk of the wheel cipher, many different combinations, in addition to the one given above, can be made of the letters. But this is the only one which will produce sense, and the cryptogrammist must keep on experimenting until he discovers a logical and intelligible message. He may then feel reasonably sure that he has deciphered the system. Lord Bacon involved the bilateral cipher in many different ways, there are probably a score of different systems used in the Shakespeare folio alone. Some so intricate that they may forever baffle all attempts at their decipherment. In those su susceptible of solution, sometimes the A's and B's have to be exchanged. At other times, the concealed message is written backwards. O again, only every other letter is counted and so on. There are several forms of the literal cipher in which the letters are substituted for each other by a prearranged sequence. The simplest form is that in which the two alphabets are written thus, which is A to Z and then Z to A, right, transposed. By substituting the letters of the lower alphabet for their equivalents in the upper one, a meaningless conglomeration results, the hidden message being decoded by reversing the process there is also a form of the literal cipher in which the actual cryptogram is written in the body of the document, but unimportant words are inserted between important ones according to prearranged order. The literal cipher also includes what are called acrostic signatures, that is, words written down the column by the use of the first letters of each line, 
and also more complicated acrostics in which the important letters are scattered through entire paragraphs or chapters. The two accompanying alchemical cryptograms illustrate another form of the literal cipher involving the first letter of each word. Every cryptogram, based upon the arrangement or combinations of the letters of the alphabet, is called a literal cipher. The pictorial cipher. Any picture or drawing with other than its obvious meaning may be considered a pictorial cryptogram. Instances, instances of pictorial cipher are frequently found in Egyptian symbolism and early religious art. The diagrams of alchemists and hermetic philosophers are invariably pictorial ciphers. In addition to the simple pictorial cipher, there are, is a more technical form in which words or letters are concealed by the number of stones in a wall, by the spread of a bird's wings in flight, by ripples on the surface of water, or by the length and order of lines used in shading. Such cryptograms are not obvious and must be decoded with the aid of an arbitrary measuring scale, the length of the lines determining the letter or word concealed, the shape and proportion of a building, the height of a tower, the number of bars in a window, the folds of a man's garment. Even the proportions or attitude of the human body were used to conceal definite figures or characters with which which could be exchanged for letters or words by a person acquainted with the code. Initial letters of names were secreted in architectural arches and spans. A notable example of this practice is found on the title page of Montague's Essays, 3rd edition, where an initial B is formed by two arches and an F by a broken arch. Pictorial cryptograms are sometimes accompanied by the key necessary for their decipherment. A figure may point towards the starting point of the cipher or carry in its hand some implement disclosing the system of measurement used. There are also frequent instances in which the cryptographer purposely distorted or improperly clothed some figure in his drawing by placing the hat on backwards, the sword on the wrong side or the shield on the wrong arm, or by employing some similar artifice. The much-discussed fifth finger on the Pope's hand in Raphael's Sistine Madonna and the sixth toe on Joseph's foot in the same artist's Marriage of the Virgin are cunningly concealed cryptograms. I'm not familiar with either one of those. The Acromatic Cipher The religious and philosophical writings of all nations abound with acromatic cryptograms, that is, parables and allegories. <clears throat> The acroamatic is unique in that the document containing it may be translated or reprinted without affecting the cryptogram. Parables and allegories have been used since remote antiquity to present moral truths in an attractive and understandable manner. The acroamatic cryptogram is a pictorial cipher drawn in words and its symbolism must be so interpreted. The Old and New Testaments of the Jews the writings of Plato and Aristotle, the New Testament's not of the Jews, Homer's Odyssey and Iliad, Virgil's a and the Metamorphosis of Apuleius, Aesop's Fables are outstanding examples of acro amantic cryptography in which are concealed the deepest and most sublime truths of ancient mystical philosophy. The acro amantic cipher is the most subtle of all, for the parable or allegory is susceptible to several interpretations. This is my favorite one, Nike. There's, if you have to conceal, then this is the way to do it. Bible study students for centuries have been confronted by this difficulty. They are satisfied with the moral interpretation of the parable and forget that each parable and allegory is capable of seven interpretations. That's interesting. And of which the seventh the highest is complete and all-inclusive, whereas the other six and lesser interpretations are fragmentary, revealing but part of the mystery. The creation myths of the world are acroamatic cryptograms, and the deities of the various pantheons are only cryptic characters, which, if properly understood, become the constituents of a divine alphabet. The initiated few comprehend the true nature of this alphabet, 
but the uninitiated, many worship the letters of it as gods. That's a new, yeah, we got a new one on the other side. So let's go ahead and look at this cryptogram here. This is an alchemical cryptogram from Brown's History of Chemistry. Veritas recte solivera laudnat philosophe homineus. Verum mandatum fiat inde xenophobius. Lege amens sophis ergo sic tuus. Right. James Campbell Brown represents, reprints a curious cipher from Kircher, Kirchner. The capital letters of the seven words in the outer circle read clockwise form the words silver. From the words in the second circle, when read in a similar manner, is derived fixedum. The capitals of the six words in the inner circle, when properly arranged, read estol. The following cipher is thus sulfur fixum est sol, which, when translated, is fixed sulfur is gold. An alchemical cryptogram. From Geheim Figuren de Rosenkreuzer. Beginning with the word visitia and reading clockwise, the seven initial letters of the seven words inscribed on the outer circles read vitriol. This is a very simple alchemical enigma, but is a reminder of those studying works on, on Hermeticism, Rosicrucianism, alchemy, and Freemasonry should always be on the lookout for concealed meanings hidden either in parables or allegories or in cryptic arrangements of numbers, letters, and words. A cryptic depiction of divine and natural justice from Selenius's Crypto Myantesis de Cryptographiae. And there is definitely some symbology in here. When we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, maybe. I don't know. This looks like to be one, right? I don't know. Let's see. The first circle portrays the divine antecedents of justice. The second, the universal scope of justice, and the third, the results of human application of justice. Hence, the first circle deals with the divine principles, the second circle with mundane affairs, and the third circle with man. One at the top of the picture sits Themius, the presiding spirit of law, and at her feet three other queens, Juno, Minerva, and Venus, their robes ornamented with geometric figures. The axis of law connects the throne of divine justice above with the throne of human judgment at the bottom of the picture. Upon the latter throne is seated a queen with a scepter in her hand, before whom stands the winged goddess Nemesis, the angel of judgment. The second circle is divided into three parts by two sets of two horizontal lines. The upper and right section is called the supreme region and is the abode of gods, the good spirits, and the heroes. The lower and dark section is the abode of lust, sin, and ignorance. Between these two extremes is the larger section in which are blended the powers and impulses of both the superior and inferior regions. In the third, or inner circle, is man, a tenfold creature consisting of nine parts, three of spirit, three of intellect, and three of soul, enclosed, enclosed within one constitution. According to Selenius, man's three spiritual qualities are thought, speech, and action. His three intellectual qualities are memory, intelligence, and will, and his three qualities of soul are understanding, courage, and desire. The third circle is further divided into three parts called ages. The golden age of spiritual truth is the upper right section, the iron age of spiritual darkness is the lower right section, and the bronze age, a composite of the two, occupying the entire left half of the inner circle in itself, divided into three parts. The lowest division of the Bronze Age depicts ignorant man controlled by force, the central the partly awakened man controlled by jurisprudence, and the upper the spiritually illuminated man controlled by love. Both the second and third circles revolve upon the axis of law, but the divine source of law, heavenly justice, is concealed by clouds. All of the symbols and figures ornamenting the plate are devoted to a detailed amplification of the principles here outlined. The numerical cipher. 
Many cryptograms have been pre produced in which numbers in various sequences are substituted for letters, words, or even complete thoughts. The reading of numerical ciphers usually depends on the possession of specially arranged tables of correspondences. The numerical cryptograms of the Old Testament are so complicated that only a few scholars versed in rabbinical lore have ever sought to unravel their mysteries. In his Oedipus Egypticus, Athanius Kircher described several Arabian Kabbalistic theorems, and a great part of the Pythagorean mystery was concealed in a secret method in vogue among Greek mystics of substituting letters for numbers. The most simple numerical cipher is that in which the letters of the alphabet are exchanged for numbers in ordinary sequence. Thus, A becomes 1, B2, C3, and so on. Counting both I and J as 9, and both U and V as W, as 20. The word yes by this system will be written 23518. This cipher can be made more difficult by reversing the alphabet so that Z becomes 1, Y2, X3, and so on. By inserting a non significant or uncounted number after each of the significant numbers, the cipher is still more effectively concealed. Thus, 23165918, the word yes is found by eliminating the second and fourth numbers. By adding 23, 5, and 18 together, the sum 46 results. Therefore, 46 is the numerical equivalent of the word yes. See, this is where you think, it's not that it's not possible, it's just too fucking complicated. According to the simple numerical cipher, the sum 138 is equal to the words, note carefully. I do get triggered by that particular number, if you are unaware. 138 is very important, right? This is God, the Trinity, and humanity wrapped up into three numbers, right? So I do use this, right? I do use cryptography. This is a key. You see 138, it's letting you know about something. And it's equal to the words, note carefully. Therefore, in a book, using this method, line 138, page 138, or paragraph 138, may contain the concealed message. In addition to this simple numerical cipher, there are scores of others so complicated that no one without the key can hope to solve them. Now, in my use of this, it would be 138 would not guide you to page 138 or line 138, but it would let you know that there is a story of manifestation told in this particular story, right? The path to ascension is here. That's what 138 would signify to me. Not that I have to count every first, third, and eighth letter and add them together and get some kind of strange thing, right? Simple is better, almost always. Authors sometimes base their cryptograms upon the numerical value of their own names. For example, Sir Francis Bacon repeatedly used the cryptic number 33, the numerical equivalent of his name. Numerical ciphers often involve the pagination of a book. Imperfect pagination, though generally attributed to carelessness, often conceals important secrets. The misimpaginations found in six in the 1623 folio of Shakespeare and the consistent recurrence of similar errors in various volumes printed about the same period have occasioned considerable thought among scholars and cryptogrammatists. In Baconian cryptograms, all page numbers ending in 89 seem to have a special significance. The 89th page of the comedies in the 1623 folio of Shakespeare shows an error of type in the pagination, the 9 being from a considerably smaller font than the 8. The 189th page is entirely missing, there being two pages numbered 187. And, and page 188 shows the second 8 scarcely more than half the size of the first one. Page 289 is correctly numbered and has no unusual features, but page 89 of the histories is missing. Several volumes published by Bacon show similar errors, page 89 being often involved. <clears throat> 
There are also numerical ciphers from which the cryptic message may be extracted by counting every tenth word, every twentieth word, or every fiftieth word. In some cases, the count is irregular. The first important word may be found by counting 100, the second by counting 90, the third by 80, and so on until the count of 10 is reached. The count then returns to 100 and the process is repeated. Again, too complicated. I'm not saying it's not possible, I'm just saying it's too complicated. The musical cipher, John Wilkins, afterwards Bishop of Chester in 1641, circulated an anonymous essay entitled Mercury, or The Secret and Swift Messenger. In this little volume, which was largely derived from the more voluminous treatises of Trithemius and Salinas, the author sets forth a method whereby musicians can converse with each other by substituting musical notes for the letters of the alphabet. Two persons, understanding the code, could converse with each other merely by playing certain notes on a piano or other instrument. Musical cryptograms can be involved to an in inconceivable point. By certain systems, it is possible to take an already existing musical theme and conceal in it a cryptogram without actually changing the composition in any way. The pendants on the notes may conceal the cipher, or the actual sound of the notes may be exchanged for syllables of similar sound. This latter method is effective, but its scope is somewhat limited. Several musical compositions by Sir Francis Bacon are still in existence. An examination of them might reveal musical cryptograms, for it is quite certain that Lord Bacon was well acquainted with the manner of their construction. The Arbitrary Cipher The system of exchanging letters of the alphabet for hieroglyphic figures is too easy, easily decoded to be popular. Albert Pike describes an arbitrary cipher based upon the various parts of the Knight Templar's cross, each angle representing a letter. The many curious alphabets that have been devised are rendered worthless, however, by the table of recurrence. According to Edgar Allan Poe, a great cryptogrammatist, the most common letter of the English language is E. The other letters in their order of frequency are as follows. A O I D H N R S T V Y C F Q L M W B K P Q X Z. Other authorities declare the table of frequency to be E T A O N I R S H D L C W U M F Y G P B V K X Q J Z. By merely <coughs> By merely counting the number of times each character appears in the message, the law of recurrence discloses the English letter for which the arbitrary character stands. Further help is also rendered by the fact that if a cryptogram be split up into words, there are only three single letters which may form words, A, I, O. Thus, any single character set off from the rest of the text must be one of these three letters. For details of this system, see The Gold Bug by Edgar Allan Poe. To render more difficult the decoding of arbitrary ciphers, however, the characters are seldom broken up into words, and further, the table of recurrence is partly nullified by assigning two or more different characters to each letter, thereby making it impossible to estimate accurately the frequency of recurrence. Therefore, the greater the number of arbitrary characters used to represent any single letter of the alphabet, the more difficult it is to decipher an arbitrary cryptogram. The secret alphabets of the ancients are comparatively easy to decode, the only requisites being a table of frequency, a knowledge of the language in which the cryptogram was originally written, a moderate amount of patience, and a little ingenuity. The Code Cipher the most modern form of cryptogram is the code system. It is its most familiar form is the Morse code for use in telegraphic and wireless communication. This form of cipher may be complicated somewhat by embodying dots and dashes into a document in which periods and colons are dots, while commas and semicolons are dashes. Sorry. 
There are also codes used by the business world which can be solved only by the use of a private codebook because they furnish an economical and efficient method of transmitting confidential information. The use of such codes is far more prevalent than the average person has any suspicion. We use encryption all the time these days, right? In addition to the foregoing classifications, there are a number of miscellaneous systems of secret writing, some employing mechanical devices, others colors. A few make use of sundry miscellaneous objects to represent words and even complete thoughts. But as these more elaborate devices were seldom employed by the ancients or by the medieval philosophers and alchemists, they have no distinct bearing <clears throat> upon religion and philosophy. The mystics of the Middle Ages, borrowing the terminology of the various arts and sciences, evolved a system of cryptography which concealed the secrets of the human of the human soul under terms generally applied to chemistry, biology, astronomy, botany, and physiology. Ciphers of this nature can only be decoded by individuals versed in the deep philosophic principles upon which these medieval mystics base their theories of life. Much information relating to the invisible nature of man is concealed under what seem to be chemical experiments or scientific speculations. Every student of symbolism and philosophy, therefore, should be reasonably well acquainted with the underlying principles of cryptography. In addition to serving him well in his researches, this art furnishes a fascinating method of developing the acuteness of the mental faculties. Discrimination and observation are indispensable to the seeker after knowledge, and no study is equal to cryptography as a means of stimulating these powers. And finally, we have one more chart. And this is Kabbalistic and Magic Alphabets from Barrett's Magus. Curious alphabets were invented by the early and medieval philosophers to conceal their doctrines and tenets from the profane. Some of these alphabets are still used, to a limited extent, in the higher degrees of Freemasonry. Probably the most famous is the angelic writing termed in the above plate the writings called Malachim. Its figures are supposedly derived from the constellations. Advanced students of occult philosophy will come upon many valuable documents in which these figures are used. Under each letter of the first alphabet above is its equivalent in English. Above each letter of the other three alphabets is its Hebrew letter equivalent. Right, and so. This is the celestial writing here in the middle, right? I can't highlight it for you, but... And then we have above it, like, the mysterious characters of letters derived by Honorus called the Thebian alphabet. Celestial writing, the writings called Malachim, the writings called Pulsing the River. Right, so this is four different types, apparently. And so we end with uh, the various codes, right? This is, again, I, I don't discount that there were codes. I don't discount that there was a need for codes. I just, I, I get really skeptical <clears throat> if you have to go too far with your assumptions, right? <clears throat> if you have a code and you have a key, then absolutely we will deal with that. But if you have what you consider to be a code and what you consider to be a key, that doesn't necessarily mean that they actually fit. You can find all kinds of things in things that are just not actually there. It is people find all kinds of things in the Bible that aren't there. That has already been proven true. And so there are definitely things that are hidden from knowledge. The things that I talk about here would get you killed. And so absolutely they had reason to hide them. They had reason for it to be complicated even. But without the proper key, like if you don't have the proper key and you're just assuming that I'm going to take it as that. There is knowledge, and if you come to me and you have deciphered this thing and the knowledge matches up with what the knowledge already is, then okay. 
if you bring me brand new knowledge that you discovered from some key that you figured out on your own, I'm going to take it with a grain of salt straight off the top. It doesn't matter who you are, how old the knowledge is. If it directly contradicts with something that I know to be true, then I'm going to dismiss it flat out of hand. If it aligns with something that I already know to be true, then I will lend you some extra credence, right? I will, I will investigate further the things that you say if it aligns with what I know to be true. That is my problem. Right? It doesn't have to be your problem. You don't have to do the same method. But that's what I do. I discount most of the things found in the Bible code. Almost all of them are discounted straight off the top. First off, the source material is severely flawed. And second, you are just randomly deciphering words and numbers and letters and pulling things out. Right, that You can retrospectively find whatever, wherever. Like, there are people that have found the Twin Towers falling in the Bible. That is a thing, but I don't think that that was ever actually a thing, right? You can find in enough source material whatever cipher you are looking for. If you go through War and Peace, you can probably find something. If you spend enough time and you exert enough effort, you can absolutely develop a code out of it. We just got told that that happened, right? They just said it right here, that... They would use existing works and change the font to encode the existing works without changing the original works, but instead just changing what you can pull out of it. Well, you can do that retroactively. It's just a matter of how willing you are to put in the effort. And so I have problems with codes. I like patterns. If knowledge is true, it will repeat and you cannot hide it, right? The key that I have of 1, 3, and 8, we find that shit everywhere. And it's becoming more apparent the more I look for it, right? That doesn't mean that I'm correct, necessarily. I believe I am, or else I would not be putting it out here. But take it with a grain of salt. That is my key that I use for various things. And I keep finding it everywhere, but it doesn't have to be true. I believe it's true. I relate to you that I believe it is true. But take it with a grain of salt. Put it to the test. See if you can find it for yourself. That's the attitude that I try to have with this particular subject matter. I don't necessarily throw it out, even though I do say I throw it out. Right? I will listen, but you have to prove it. It is like when you come at me with the Bible. And it's like, well, have you considered you know, dispensationalism? Well, yes, yes, I did. As a matter of fact... I, I did consider the major thing that most people consider when they are reading this book. I did. I did look at that. And just because I happen to disagree with dispensationalism doesn't mean that I'm incorrect. I have been correct on many things that many people have said the opposite of. And so, we're going to go ahead and wrap this one up. I don't necessarily cast aspersions on the fact that there are codes. I do believe that. I do cast aspersions on the fact that we can just randomly decide that this is a code. Now, you have to prove it to me. It has to be reproducible. It has to be meaningful. Right? There's no point in having a code that tells you the sky is blue. Right? It has to tell you that the earth is a globe in the time when everybody believed that it was flat. It has to be some hidden knowledge. It can be hidden the earth is flat when we know that it's a globe. Because if it is your code saying that the earth is flat, I'm going to dismiss it. Fall off out of the top. I know we're on a globe. You don't have to believe that. There are a lot of people who don't believe that. But if you're here and if you're listening to me, take it. The earth is a globe. Hopefully I brought a little bit of enlightenment, not too much confusion, and maybe a little bit of levity to a series of somewhat difficult topics, right? Again, I don't have a whole lot to expound upon this. I am not a fan of codes. I understand the necessity. I understand that they exist, but I'm not a fan of it. I don't like hidden knowledge. It's why I'm doing what I'm doing. If you like what I'm doing over here, let me know down below. Give me a like, share, and a sub. Throw me a comment. Let me know if you agree or disagree. If it remains respectful, it gets to remain up. And if you really like what I'm doing, hit me with that super thanks because I am not a communist. To the crew.
Thanks for hanging out. I appreciate every single minute that you are here with me, and I am praying for you every single day. Until next time, I love you. God loves you. You are perfect, whole, and complete just the way that you are. And this has been Pitt's Tate. Peace.